This is the Sex and Censorship Podcast. Welcome to episode three of the Sex and Censorship Podcast. This week's interview is one I recorded a while ago with the stripper and activist Edie Lamour. But first, here's a roundup of news from the world of sex and censorship, the home of free expression. This is Jerry Barnett. You can find us at sexandcensorship.org, on Twitter as Porn Panic, and we have a Facebook page. Um, if you like what we do, you can join our mailing list, spread the word to your friends, and why not donate to us? We accept PayPal and Bitcoin. We've never actually had a Bitcoin donation so far, so you could be our first. British sex worker activist Charlotte Rose was in the news again this week, as a man with a bionic penis got to use it for the first time. Let's explain a bit. When he was six years old, Mohammed Abad, better known as Mo, lost his penis in a road accident. It's hard to imagine how an accident like that might, have, might blight a person's life and what the effects on his self-confidence in his adult life might have been. Years later, modern medicine provided him with a bionic penis, or at least that's what the press has called it, and he could finally think about having sex for the first time. This week, now aged 44, Mo lost his virginity. This was met with an accompanying fanfare of media coverage. The story is a touching, feel-good one, but with hidden depths. It's also a story of triumph for our National Health Service, which equipped Mo with a new, quote, bionic 8-inch penis. But the part of the story that most piqued media interest was that Mo's first sexual experience was with sex worker Charlotte Rose. Charlotte is Britain's best-known prostitute and has won multiple awards for her campaigning work. The story of the man with the bionic penis is a reminder of something that's so often overlooked in the debates over sex work. Sex workers don't just provide hedonistic pleasure. They're often the only option for men, and sometimes women, who for a wide variety of reasons may not be able to find sexual partners. Many sex workers, including Charlotte, provide services to disabled men with few other realistic options. Sex workers can provide a caring, non-judgmental service to people like Mohammed, who may understandably be terrified about how, how their unusual bodies might be received by a less experienced sexual partner. I challenge those people who seek to ban sex work to meet with people like Charlotte Rose and Mo to explain to them why people like him should not have the right to pay for sex, when sex is such a vital part of a happy and healthy life for everyone. Not everyone is lucky enough to have the confidence, ability, charm or social network to find regular sexual partners. Why should such people be denied the right to a sex life? Also in the news, the British government has announced that poppers, a recreational drug, will be exempt from the coming clampdown on, quotes, legal highs to be introduced next month. Poppers are popular for use during sex and especially used... Um, widely by gay men. In a recent debate on the bans, the gay Tory MP Crispin Blunt outed himself as a poppers user. The government reversal comes following an intervention by the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, the ACMD, which advised that poppers may not be a drug under the definition used in the new law. It's to be celebrated that at least one drug will be spared the ban, but the exception only serves to highlight the ludicrous nature of this new law. At a stroke, thousands of diverse substances will be made illegal to supply. The law is not drafted to deal with harmful substances, but all psychoactive substances, regardless of whether they're harmful or not. This makes a mockery of government claims that the, the bans are an attempt at harm reduction. In fact, such bans tend to increase rather than reduce drug harm by criminalising the supply chain and reducing government's ability to regulate drugs. Users often, often substitute one drug for another. So, for example, cocaine usage fell when methadrone was legally available. This fact didn't stop the then Labour government from banning methadrone, against the advice of the ACMD, no doubt to the relief of the cocaine trade. British governments have a long history of pointless and often dangerous drug bans. Questionable decisions in recent years include the bans on magic mushrooms and on, on cat, neither considered to be dangerous substances, but they have never until now tried to ban so many substances at a stroke. The repercussions are impossible to predict, but one can guess that again the cocaine trade will benefit. We can be relieved that some common sense was seen in the popper's exemption, but common sense and government drug policy are rarely found in each other's company. At a time when cannabis is being legalised in a number of countries, Britain feels increasingly backward. And now to this week's interview. I recorded this almost five years ago as I began to become involved in sexual freedom politics. It's still very relevant, I think. Edie Lamour is a stripper who became politically involved when a campaign began in East London to close down strip clubs. She began to realise that a war on sexual freedom was building and that strippers were the first target, so she referred to herself as the canary in the coal mine. I'm sitting with Edie Lamour, who's a stripper. That's Lamour, spelt L-A-M-O-R-T, as in death. Um, 
Hi, Edie. Nice to meet you. Hi. Tell me a bit about how you became a stripper um, and why you do it. Um, I've always done music and performance, and I basically was doing the usual day job that destroys you by the end of the day and you have no money, and decided I was going to do something that paid full-time wages for part-time work so I could go and do all my music and my band stuff and my performance stuff as well. But also because... Um, I'm naturally inclined to be a performer and be on stage. Actually dancing four or five times a week was really great for my stage craft. I would kind of take the awareness of audience and knowing how to work a crowd, knowing how to conduct myself on stage into the band situation as well. Obviously, you know, you don't do any booty shaking and stuff like that unless, <laughs> you know, you're having a really good time with the audience. But it is there's a certain element of stagecraft that you learn and becomes natural to you, which really helps for any other kind of performance. So how long have you been stripping? When, when did you start? Um, I started in in America, in San Francisco. Lived in San Francisco for about 14 months. Started at Centerfolds, and then they got done by the uh, tax man. <laughs> and so everybody had to go down to the Gold Club. That's I, I know San Francisco. Whereabouts is that? The Gold Club is south of Market. Okay, so that, that used to be a grotty area, and it's kind of getting trendy these days. Yes, I mean, it was... When I was there, which was 15 years ago now, it yeah. was every, all the artists had their warehouses and studios and things like that. So it was, you know, the crack hotels, the welfare <laughs> people, and then the artists and the strip clubs, which is kind of the same vibe that it was in Hackney in East London as well. It was a similar kind of mix, and that's when you get, well, that's when you get that combination of creativity and freedom that has basically generated so much so many cultural things mm. so it's a kind of hedonism that happens where where there aren't taxpayers around to complain about bad things going on in in the neighborhood then you get all sorts of things happening at the same time. Yeah, I mean, Shoreditch is a perfect example now. 15 years ago, it was a hub for artists, musicians, all the strip clubs were around there, the burlesque scene started there, pole dancing, you know, was developed from just, you know, doing a little twirl around the pole to the art form that it is, kind of, well, there and all over the world. Mm. Um, but in terms of the kind of London scene that was the space where you had the freedom and the opportunity to do that kind of thing and a lot of creative people came together and you know now you have the situation in Shoreditch where you've got a lot of middle class people moving in suddenly going oh I don't approve of this we must shut it down and it's like well why did you move to this area you moved because it was trendy and because it was fashionable and now you're complaining about the things that made it fashionable in the first place. So yeah, gentrification. Uh, actually, I think the same's happened south of market. So, dot com companies moved in there, <clears throat> and property prices shot up. And then suddenly, people don't didn't want to see homeless people in their area or have strip <laughs> clubs or you know. Um, exactly. You know. Move them on. Move them on. I've been reliably assured by feminists that people like you, you've either got a pimp or you've or you've got heroin or crack habit. Well, let's see. No, I'm not a crack addict. I can say I have never, ever taken crack, and I do not wish to. Um, I'm not a heroin addict either. Um, um, no, no man has ever tried to force me to do it. A few have tried to tell me to stop. All the strippers that I've met, I have never met a a frail, weak, frightened, bullied little thing. This is a myth, and the whole feminism argument is a red herring and a distraction from the real argument, which happens to be about freedom and civil liberties. And what kind of society do you want to live in? Do you want to be free to be yourself and do what you want to do? Or would you like restrictions imposed upon you? One thing that these feminists, so-called feminists, because they're not really feminists, um don't seem to understand is that as the decades have progressed we have become more free years ago if a woman wore a short skirt she would be condemned as a slut and now as we've moved forward you can wear whatever you like you can be yourself you can express yourself and that's great the emancipation of women has also brought along sexual emancipation which 
not only affects women, but it affects gay, transgender, lesbian, uh, BDSM scene, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Some people might not be into it, some people might not approve of it, but if you want freedom and you want to protect your freedoms overall, you have to allow other people to do things that you might not be into. You cannot go around condemning people and telling them, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. You all must be like me. I will enforce my way upon you and it will make me feel safe about myself. That is not what you can do. It, this, that is not freedom. Nobody ever asked the women. Yeah, exactly. Nobody ever asks us. <laughs> it's one of the things we find most offensive about groups like Object and UK Feminista. And when we do try to talk to them and try to say, hold on a second, this is our point of view, they accuse us of having Stockholm Syndrome um, the debate I went to about a month ago, um, I knew they were going to tell me I had Stockholm Syndrome, so I already kind of got that out before before they even got there. And then at the end, they told me I was a propagandist for the sex industry and my pimp must have paid me <laughs> to do it. I was like, no, nobody's paying me. I'm doing all this for free. I wish somebody would pay me, but I'm doing it because I think what you're doing is wrong and very misguided. I accept this kind of attack from the religious right. You know where they're coming from and they're honest in their views. What, what's dishonest is groups like Object that you mentioned who are typically middle-class women who seem to disapprove of the way a lot of working-class women make their income and are as determined to save them from being fallen women as, say, the missionaries of the 19th century were. Yeah, one of the... Um uh, reassuring things was the article written by Workers' Liberty on... I think that was the only journalist that was there at the Tower Hamlets debate, who um, she kind of... At the end, she was a bit... She was sceptical all the way through the debate, and then at the end, she was like, I just felt like I'd been... I'd gone into a time machine and be trans transported back to, like, 1830s to some kind of Victorian missionary meeting... <laughs> And there is this, you know, they want to rescue you like a, a kind of religious fundamentalist, very Victorian, trussed-up way of, of thinking, and it's deeply patronising. And if you tell them, actually, no, I don't want you to rescue me, I'm fine, they then accuse you of having psychological problems. Interestingly, I've been reading a book on the history of Bedlam, <laughs> And the amount of women throughout the ages who were condemned to lunatic asylums for being sexual in any way whatsoever, which is a completely natural urge for being what would be seen as deviant or gay or anything like this, they were all condemned to lunatic asylums. These people are trying to reverse the historical trend they are trying to take us all back like a hundred years or so. And the most worrying thing is that they sit up there on panels next to religious fundamentalists and it's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Can't you see that you will be next? If you manage to succeed in your mission to ban all of us and persecute all of us, it will close in around you as well. You are only free because we are free. Objectification is something that confuses the hell out of me because I've heard it going around for 20 or 30 years and I still haven't got a clue what it's supposed to mean. Can you explain what objectification <laughs> is? Um, it seems like a very ridiculous way to discuss human interaction and human sexuality and attraction. It's even in the sex industry or a strip club... Attraction works on many different levels. To just look at a pair of tits and go, whoa, is, it's, it is always more complicated than that. You know, if it was just somebody looking at your tits, it would mean I would have dances all the time and I wouldn't have to go up and talk to people. <laughs> I would just be like, da da, da da, da da, da da, but it's not, it's about personality as well. It's not just one thing, it's many different things. In terms of men gazing upon me, or women gazing upon me, because don't forget, there are gay strip clubs as well. Um, I've danced several times at the candy bar, mm -hmm. the lesbian bar, so I've had women look at me 
and then I've danced in Browns, in the White Horse, at the Peel, and men have looked at me. Or, you know, you'll get a couple in who are having a little fantasy with themselves, and they'll book you for a private dance, <laughs> and they both enjoy it. Mm. Um, and also in the Tower Hamlets thing, uh, which they don't include on their website, they're also going to close down a gay, a male gay strip club as well, as well, where men dance for men. Yeah, and I, it's I this find obsession it. Session <clears throat> with women being these kind of delicate little flowers, these fragile creatures who must be covered and hidden away, and. It's Which is about as far away from feminism as you can get. Exactly, but that's the kind of thing that they're trying to re-establish and reinforce, mm. which is nuts. Yeah. So in Tower Hamlets, you're fighting actions to get strip clubs closed down. What's happening there at the moment? Um, well, they did the consultation. The results have been in for a month, yet they haven't published them. Um, I think it's because it didn't go their way. They wanted it to be... Um, they wanted it to everyone to go against the strip venues, but I think it's actually gone in favour of them. Mm -hmm. um, this was sent to me by one of the customers, actually. I don't know how we managed to get this information. Edie brandishes a document. <laughs> but it's the minutes from the Tower Hamlets councillors' meeting. Um before they even put the consultation out, which basically they claim that these venues are often associated with drugs, prostitution, human trafficking, alcohol abuse, antisocial behaviour and noise. Now, if you speak to the Metropolitan Police and ask them which venues are associated with these kind of things, pretty much all the normal nightclubs will be off the scale in comparison to strip clubs, SEV venues. Um, all these minutes basically show that they've already decided before it went to consultation that they should close all these venues down. So it's not exactly a dem democratic um, consultation that they're doing, which is kind of what they did in Hackney as well. Um, in terms of the human trafficking, the argument that they always go on about in a very irresponsible way it's been EU law for at least 10 years now that when you start working at a place, it doesn't matter whether it's a strip venue or a temp agency, a restaurant, a bar, whatever it is, you have to show your documents to show that you, are, you have an EU passport or you've got a visa to work anywhere in the European Union. Yeah. That was brought in to stop all the illegal immigration, but of course that means that there, are, there is not one single trafficked person in a legal licensed venue can I just ask about one other thing, which is the claims, again, coming from groups like Object, that, that there are more rapes in areas where there are, are lap dance um, clubs or strip clubs? Um, there's actually evidence to show the opposite, but I would be very <laughs> wary of getting into any of those statistics really showing anything honest, because... I don't think it's got anything to do with... If some man goes into a strip club and sees a stripper who is not already fucked up in the head, it will not suddenly make him leave the club and go, oh, I'm going to go raping. <laughs> it's just... It's ridiculous. Um, the figures I've seen is show that across the West, Western world, rape has come down massively in the past 30 years. Now, I'm sure that's not down to strip clubs or the availability of porn or whatever, but there are changes in society. What it seems to say is that openness about sexuality is good for women, presumably good for children as well who may be abused, um, and that actually by attacking sexuality and by trying to push it underground, you can only make things worse. Definitely, and it's also rape is about power and control. In our Western liberal democracies where we have openness about sex to a certain extent. We have more rights for women and more freedoms, and they kind of go hand in hand. There's a good report done by Brooke Magnati, who was a bel de jour, who kind of tackled this issue, and basically it just shows that it's got nothing to do with anything. In London, for example, Lambeth has the highest level of rape, and that has no strip clubs. 
at the end of her report, she's got men who rape don't do so by accident. Ordinary men without tendencies to rape do not do so inadvertently or because they suddenly went to a lap dancing club.